Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first episode of Eric Explores. I am your host, Eric Poole, and today our subject is going to be about ham radios. Now, I'm sure a few of you may be asking, what exactly is a ham radio? Where did the idea come from? Well, tonight, all of your questions will be answered, and they will be answered by our expert tonight and our guest, Mr. Jim Allen. How are you, Jim? Hey, Eric. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, Glad to be here. Thank you for being here. All right, so I'm sure a lot of us out here don't really know the, the answer to this question, but I'm sure you know. So what, <laughs> what exactly is a radio? Well, let's start with the basics. As, uh, actually, what, how does a radio catch what it receives? Uh, it starts out in waves, radio waves traveling through the atmosphere, and they're modulated in such a way that it actually carries signals like code or uh, music and things like that. And then the radio is actually the part that translates those waves into something that we can hear out of a speaker. Or headphones. So, like, just waves in general, you know, they can carry, like, sound and images. And That's right, like that. yeah. All right. Uh, so, uh, when was the uh, radio invented? Well, the radio itself was actually invented in the 1890s. Um, there was two key players back then. One was um, Nicholas Tesla, and the other one was Marconi. Uh, mm -hmm. Tesla actually had some gear that he put together and demoed in Philadelphia in about 1893, and uh, kind of set his stake in the ground as being kind of probably the first guy that was working on a radio. Marconi came along in about 1895, and he actually built the first wireless transmitter. And it was called wireless because up until then they'd been sending Morse code over wires, and so there's no wires, and he actually could send a signal over a mile, and that was a, a big deal back then. Now, nowadays it's not such a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, but there was actually a lot of um, battling over who actually had, dis had invented radio, and that finally ended in 1943 when it was settled in the U.S. Supreme Court where they actually decided that, uh, that uh, Tesla was actually the first guy that had invented radio. Oh, wow. Um, Marconi, though, was actually the guy that kind of, he was a salesman, he was a marketing guy that kind of took it to a new height, and he had set up a global communications company, probably the first one ever, and that mm -hmm. was uh, in about 1895. Uh, he actually set up uh, shipboard radios, he set up ground stations to receive the signals and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually had a monopoly on it as well. Uh, you couldn't have a shipboard radio without having a Marconi man on board. <laughs> yeah. That's what they called him, the Marconi man. There were, regardless to say, there was few women in the radio business in those days. Yeah. Uh, so shipping companies used to use the radios to kind of um, arri announce arrivals of, sh of, of boats what was on the boats, and they actually, on the passenger liners, would take uh, Marconi grams, they called them, to yeah. send <laughs> messages to uh, the folks that you were going to meet in New York or whatever, if you were coming over from Europe, that kind of thing. So that's kind of where it started. Um, it was a spark station that they used, mm -hmm. spark meaning that they were generating radio waves with spark gaps. So mm -hmm. they'd key a rather high voltage source, shoot a spark gap across it, and as that spark gap flipped, it would transmit radio waves. And so back in those days, though, it was very simple. It was code. So they would send on a key and send out bursts of sparks as code, dots and dashes kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And what they had at, at the other end was a receiver, a very crude receiver, a crystal set, to receive the radio waves. And people listened to them in headphones. And mm -hmm. it wasn't very sophisticated, though. It was more of a zzz, 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 zzz when you heard the spark coming in over the, over the headphones kind mm -hmm. of thing. So. Boy, are the people who invented radio, are they still given credit till this day, or, or do people say, you know, some other person came up no, with the idea? No, actually, ever since that Supreme Court case, Tesla's been the one that's been really tagged as the inventor of radio. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty well stuck by now. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I see you have some stuff for us to show us. So what exactly yeah. is all well, this? Yeah, well, this is actually kind of, this is actually real spark gear here we're looking at that was actually used back in spark days. Um, we have here is a key. Remember I told you that you keyed a spark source. Well, this was the kind of key that they would have used. And uh, interesting thing about it is it's really heavy on an insulated base and had little holes and they actually would mount them directly on the desk to keep the key from moving. Mm -hmm. And if you look right in here, there's some really large contacts for the key to work on. Uh, on land-based keys, they were just sending low voltage electricity, so they had really small contacts. But in a spark station, you could have up to 2600 volts going across those contacts, so you needed really beefy contacts to send the signal. Uh, and when they moved a little bit downwind in technology and got into arc transmitters, it was the same kind of thing. Uh, but you had to be very careful as an operator. You never wanted to get your fingers around these contacts because uh, back in the, in the arc spark days, you could actually get 250 volts at about 30 amps across that. And uh, 
that was definitely a hair-raising experience when you did something like that. <laughs> so I'm sure there's many, many of those guys that actually got cooked using these keys if they weren't very <laughs> careful with them. It's not a good way to take cooking lessons. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> anyway, um, this is another piece of spark gear here. It's actually a antenna switch, and it was probably used on a ship uh, by the designation that I see on the front here. Uh, it was at times it was important to take your antenna out of the circuit. So basically, you throw it to get the antenna in, and you throw it up to get the antenna out of mm -hmm. the circuit. Uh, when you wanted to receive, you would put it in this off position. When you want to transmit, you would shove it down. It was also a protection of lightning. When lightning was flashing, you always wanted to have your gear disconnected with the antenna, so you'd flick, flick the switch up like that. Mm -hmm. And last but not least is the technology that you might have used to actually receive um, a spark source. Uh, this is a crystal radio. Uh, a lot of kids, you know, have projects with crystal radios and this kind of thing. This is actually a 1921 DeForest crystal set. Mm -hmm. And not very, not very hard. Main components are antenna and ground going up here. Mm -hmm. There's two um, binding posts down here to actually attach your headset to for listening because they, they didn't have speakers then yet. Mm -hmm. And in the middle is the crystal device here. It's just a piece of Galena crystal that you actually tickled with a little wire to get the signal that you had in and tuned a little bit with this coil to get a strong signal. So they would have carried a similar thing aboard a ship and John Q. Public would have been listening to this instead of a, a TV or a uh, mm -hmm. internet connection kind of thing back then. Yeah. Boy, you didn't really know your stuff about this. So really quick, right back to this and just a really quick question. So if you, let's just say there is an electrical storm, right? This thing can save you from being fried up, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure you don't have the electricity at the wrong point at the wrong <laughs> time. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't want to be that person who went through that. Anyways, so um, how did amateur radio start? Well, amateur radio, it was an interesting thing. It was a real... Um, passionate thing for a lot of folks and a, and a real a fantasy kind of thing because it started in the days of um, when they had a lot of emergencies at sea, ships sinking and things like that. Uh, for instance, in 1909, uh, the good ship Republic ran into the good ship Florida off the coast of the United States. Mm -hmm. And in days gone by, the ships would have sunk, people would have died, mm -hmm. but the Republic had a Marconi man aboard yeah. with Marconi <laughs> radio gear. So he was able to summon other ships to actually pull people off and get survivors and things like that before the ships went down. Mm -hmm. So it really was something, it was, it was the aspect of using a tool like that to save somebody in an emergency. It was an aspect of also uh, long distance communication. You could talk to people for the first time you could over long distance for no money at all. Um, we actually have a, a photograph here of a station uh, that was used in uh, 1912, the Dodd station. It's a really nice photo of uh, kind of the operating position that, that Marion Dodd had. Again, he was, uh, I think he was about 20 years old when he built this station. Uh, you can see it looks pretty crude, and that's because he made it out of apple boxes and things <laughs> like that. Not a lot of technology went into this. Old lead plates and old batteries and anything he could get his hands on, he put into the station. Mm -hmm. um, the key that I sh just showed you uh, the, on the marble base, that's a pretty sophisticated key for the spark gear. Mm -hmm. This guy didn't have any money, so what he did, he took a regular key and he welded dimes on to make the large contacts so they got a spark station with it. So he could, in, in, the, uh, in the one that the, my friend restored, you can actually still see the dimes on the key that he had actually welded to the... Uh, to the uh, spark key that he had. Um, you know, I, I talked a little bit about the kind of the adventure. Well, part of that was uh, kind of a bunch of junk novels that were written actually for um, kids. And that's who mostly got invo involved in the spark era mm -hmm. were teenagers. Teenage boys in particular were hot after this kind of stuff. So they were ones building the spark stations. No, it's not like that anymore, is it? No, no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> it's all about Xbox now. There you yeah. go. Uh, but, you know, there was a lot of these books that were written. Um, these both are from 1915. The first one is The Boy Inventor and the Radio Telephone. Uh, somebody saved the day in, in this particular book. This other one is The Motorboat Club and the Wireless Set, where the motorboat club goes out with a radio and they save somebody uh, at, at sea kind of thing. So uh, kind of the romance of radio. Uh, my fa hands-on favorite, though, is Stand By. <laughs> this was actually... Uh, you can see this on the cover here. There's a crashed Zeppelin that he crashed in. Mm -hmm. There's one of the kids standing here guarded with a gun while his buddy gets on the radio and calls for help with the Aurora Borealis flashing over the ice. You know, it's an amazing, amazing graphic to really get 
kids inspired to get into the into the radio age. Mm -hmm. So was that was were these books written like during like a certain war? Because I know the Zeppelin was part of a war. Or yeah, like actually, no. The books actually started coming out, and I have copies of, of books that were written in 1909, from 1909 on up. This one was actually the Standby was actually written in 1920, so uh -huh. they were written through the war. Although an interesting thing to say about it is ham radio was was totally shut down during World War One because of the fact they didn't want people enemies sending messages out of the United States on on radio. So oh, wow, yeah, I take it as all of this stuff is pretty expensive overall. Oh, it can be. Yeah, yeah. it can be. All right. Well, um, how, in your opinion, how has um, amateur radio developed uh, from its beginning? Well, again, it, it's, it started kind of as an, an emergency thing, but it got driven by several different things. It was driven by technologies. Mm -hmm. It was driven by regulations. It was driven by organizations that were put in place to kind of promote the use of ham radio. Um, mm -hmm. As far as technology goes, um, it was actually, uh, th I think it was in 1906, a fellow by the name of Reginald Fezden actually did the first voice transmission. And that was the first kind of piece of technology that drove uh, radio. It was on Christmas Eve in 1906. Uh, oh, wow. Reginald got on the air with his violin and played Oh Holy Night for a few bars and then read passages of the Bible. Uh, he was just experimenting with it, but shocked the hell out of the ships out at sea. <laughs> <laughs> Used to getting the through, all of a sudden there's characters playing the violin and reading Bible passages. So that, mm -hmm. was, that was kind of, a, kind of an interesting thing. Um, another thing that happened as far as regulations was in 1912, the federal government actually passed some laws that made an amateur have to be licensed before he could actually operate. Uh, mm -hmm. And part of the licensing was he, they had to operate on certain frequencies. Mm -hmm. Another part of the license is they had to have a, a call sign to identify themselves on the air. Mm -hmm. um, so th they started out with the call signs, and then all of a sudden somebody got the idea that they could send contact cards. Um, and uh, so you'd contact the station, and you'd exchange, ca exchange cards through the mail with your call letters on them. And it was sort of interesting to see the progression of them. This first one, uh, I don't know if you can see the really detail on this one. Um, the call sign is just written in pencil on the card, and there's some typed messages here. So mm -hmm. that was pretty interesting stuff. Uh, and then some guy got the idea, well, they could do a, a photograph card. So here's a card from 1925, a sailor in uh, Hawaii. See so his little picture down here in the corner. And there's his call sign. And there's all about the, the call that he made with another station in California. Mm -hmm. And then they got really fancy and got into the designs, the lightning bolts and things like that. It was, it was very cool. Um, these days, they actually still use these cards. Um, this mm -hmm. is actually one of mine here. It's not my regular call, but it was one that I used when I was in French Polynesia operating on a sailboat. And when you're in somebody else's territorial waters, you have to get a dis different license, one of their licenses and one of their calls. So I was FO0ALL when I was down in Tahiti oh, wow. operating off of a sailboat. And MM here means marine mobile. So um, these were actually called, uh, eventually called QSL cards. And the reason for that is, mm -hmm. is that they had a, a Q code uh, that they made a whole list of three-letter uh, initials that meant something. So, mm -hmm. for instance, QSL meant I, I have had a successful contact with you, so they called it a QSL card, and mm -hmm. so that's what they call them today is a QSL card. All right. All right. Well, um, I'm sure that, that you know, it's, it's still, still pretty cool, you know, to have this kind of stuff. But we have a, a video to show you about um, what radio has done for Hurricane Katrina. Take a look at this. Communication was gone. Cell phones died. Nothing worked. Without the ham radios, we were not able to um, communicate with our shelters because the phone lines are down. We weren't able to communicate with our other resources 
like FEMA and MEMA and the Office of Emergency Management. With no communication whatsoever, with all the systems down, uh, it was very important to Dr. O'Brien. Communications are extremely fragile and that tends to be our biggest issue. As soon as the wind died down just a little, I was up stringing antennas up on the roof. I immediately began to pass uh, um, emergency traffic physicians, uh, nurses, uh, any state, bring your license. Uh, we need medical supplies, additional vaccines, uh, technical I was handling HF traffic, emergency traffic, and a lot of it. There were uh, requests for rescue. There were still people trapped uh, in dormitories at some of the universities in, uh, in New Orleans. Uh, I handled a lot of uh, emergency traffic there. That, Uh, let's face it, this is the greatest natural disaster we've had in the United States. It's really been an experience for me and uh, I'm glad to help. I wound up uh, setting up in a uh, Walmart parking lot. I was receiving uh, traffic over the HF net, a lot of uh, search and rescue. People trapped in attics, uh, uh, people trapped on roofs. There was a woman in labor with serious complications. and. Uh, she was not going to make it if she didn't get out. They couldn't get a helicopter into that hospital. But, uh, the helicopter got into Tulane Hospital, and then they had a boat en route to uh, pick her up. And uh, we had her ready to go and, uh, and getting in the boat. She got out uh, safely and got into the chopper. That, that was a, a real heartwarming experience. Because I am from New Orleans, this region is a very deep and super important part of who I am. I had to do something. This is my first emergency as a ham radio operator. We put up an antenna at the Red Cross headquarters in Brookhaven, set them up with a radio base, moved down to Gulfport, did some work there, slept in a school. It's better than sitting home and watching it on TV. It's very difficult for me because I'm from New Orleans. I went ahead and got my ticket after 9-11 because I, I wanted to be of some use. I, I love the idea of talking on the radio to people on the other side of the planet who you, you've never seen. And, um, and so I, I did it so that I would be of use. And it's paid off. It's really paid off. It was such a relief to myself and Dr. Mala and Dr. Brian to have, have Mike and uh, all those people out there that helped to communicate with him. Uh, it's definitely a, a definite, warm, uh, heartfelt thank you from, from me and from our staff. Without the ham operators, we really don't have a way to communicate. Now, I'd like to say to the ham operators that helped us with this hurricane that they have been a wonderful asset. They've always had a smile on their face, they work really long, hard hours, and they were there to support us in every way that they could. So I say a heartfelt thank you from the shelter members, from the staff, and also from the Red Cross. Cell phones, landline telephones, internet, email. Outside of that, what is there? I mean. If it's all down, it's down, and you know, if you can't get at the airwaves via the ham operators, and you got there's no communication. Thanks, guys. Myself personally and the Red Cross truly, truly, truly offers their complete and wholehearted thanks. I think the American people offer their thanks in that the people in this area are really appreciative of what their efforts are because, from what I understand, you're all doing this as full volunteers no recompense, you're paying your own way, um, and that goes really above and beyond anything that I have known before. So a very wonderful, heartfelt thanks, and keep coming back, and if there's anything that we can do for you guys, let us know. Wow, that was pretty cool. So Jim, I, I understand that you have some uh, tool, uh, tube gear here that you've also worked with in the past? Absolutely, uh, Eric. This is actually the station I had when I was nine years old oh, in wow. 1959 uh, that I used first out of the hole, a NC33 receiver mm -hmm. and a Micromold CW transmitter, code only. Wow. Yeah. Uh, this is the key. Um, this is actually what they call boat anchors because uh, boat anchors are heavy tube type things. 
Uh, but this is small boat anchors because I know fellows that run transmitters that weigh 2,000 pounds. They have them in the garage, mm -hmm. and wow. the receivers get as big as three or 400 pounds sometimes. So it's immense kind of gear. Um, it gets larger with some of the uh, some of the uh, microphone type driven gear, uh, the AM gear, and uh, they have a lot of, of of microphones and stuff they use. And this is kind of the classic mm -hmm. microphone here, which is a uh, a static D104 mic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually been made since the 20s, from 1920 oh. till about the year 2000. They made them into different models. And so if you see a boat anchor enthusiast like me running a set of gear, he probably has one of those D104 microphones that he's, that he's using. Oh, yeah. Are those things that, like rare to buy nowadays, or you can just you know go to some radio store and just see those and just pick it up? Uh, you used to be able to buy these at radio stores, but now you have to get them off of Evil Bay or someplace like <laughs> that or Craigslist. Yeah, I've seen them on Craigslist before. And that's, they're not that expensive either, unless you buy the really early ones which were mounted in, in big uh, spring mm -hmm. mounts like these. Um, this, this is an older carbon mic, but you could sometimes see these ecstatic mounts mounted in the middle of these big spring mounts from the 20s. Mm -hmm. So a little, definitely a little which bit different Which end do you work. talk out of? I'm a little. Uh, on this one, you would be talking into this end, which was the diaphragm. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier on the modern day microphone you talk into the screen. Oh, yeah, if you're talking into the <laughs> solid back there, you're not doing a good job. <laughs> no, you're not. Your, your fidelity is, isn't great. So. Um, and actually, this 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 particular oh, well set is uh, is an, as an outcome of, of this this older set from the 20s. This is actually a one tuber that developed into something like this in the 40s, then on to bigger receivers now. All right. Well, for some of you who are interested in ham radio or just want to learn about ham radio in general, we have a video for you, so so you can just figure out how to do that. Take a look at this one. Imagine sitting in your room talking to people in distant lands. Imagine hearing world events as they happen. Listening to far off places with strange names. Imagine hearing a voice crackle through the air calling you. Come, talk, be a friend. It's your world out there. Say hello. Hello, I am WD4Y. Hi, I'm KB1KJC. That's Kilo Bravo 1, Kilo Juliet Charlie. Early attempts at sending voices over the air were unintelligible, but on December 24, 1906, Reginald Fessenden shocked radio operators all across the North Atlantic who heard his voice coming from their radios, saying hello to them and wishing them Merry Christmas. Fessenden's historic feat caused inquisitive hobbyists to join those experimenting with this new technology called radio. They were and are still called amateur radio operators. We invite you to discover what amateur radio offers in the 21st century. Hello. Jack, W8ISH. Hello. Making friends around the world, talking to another ham via an orbiting satellite, or swapping call signs with hams in over 100 countries in a single weekend. Volunteers save lives as part of their involvement in an emergency response. Talking from Chicago to the Carolinas with a pocket-sized handheld radio. This unique mix of fun, public service, and convenience is amateur radio. Amateur radio operators come from all walks of life. Rock stars, missionaries, astronauts, doctors, students, politicians, truck drivers, and just plain folks. They're all ages, income levels, and nationalities. Amateur radio operators have continued to be in the forefront of developing technologies years in advance of when they're rolled out to the public. FM, television, mobile telephones, and VOIP technologies were all used by amateur radio operators years ahead of the public. Whether the preference is Morse code, voice communication, or computerized messages, amateur radio is where an average person can, using their own gear, talk freely across town or around the world to others. Hello. Hello. I am DL1 BDF, Delta Lima 1, Bravo, Delta, Florida. Basic study materials for passing the FCC test and getting your first license usually cost less than $40. There are also licensed classes held by many local groups for people who want more personal help. If possible, taking part in one of these classes is the best way to go, but there's even an online course you can take if you prefer. Once you have your first license, it usually costs less than $200 to get your first radio and start saying hello. Founded in 1914, the 150,000 member American Radio Relay League is the national association for amateur radio in the USA. 
Other countries have their own national organizations. The ARRL is a primary source of information about what is going on in the ham radio world. It provides books, news, support, and information for individuals and clubs. For 100 years, the magic of human voice over the radio has brought imaginations to life. It opened a whole new era of human communication. It's your world. Get on the radio and say hello. To learn more, go to www.helloradio.org. Boy, that was pretty cool. Right, well, we will feed you more information about this on the uh, upcoming credits. But, Jim, I'd like to thank you so much for being here. Well, nice being here. I can enjoy myself. Thanks yeah, for thank inviting you. me. Boy, we learned a lot. It was pretty good. And I hope to see you here next time on Eric Explorers. This is Eric Poole saying over and out. Have a good night. Thank you.